Chapter 25 Primal Fear Ellie's support for Brad's self-improvement was unconditional, even after he turned her carefully arranged temple trip into a competitive sport. The monks had beaten him at every form of spiritual practice, and that made him bitter. They played me, he said, as they sat waiting to board their flight back to California. They set me up for their hardest gyo practices and laughed at me when I failed. His attitude caused Ellie to fret. Her purpose had been to help him get past his crushing defeat at the hands of her father, who had decimated her husband's belief that leaving his family when he was still in high school had been for the best. Had she made another mistake? Maybe she should have never brought him to Japan. The temple experience that was supposed to lift his spirits just gave him something else to fail at. She slumped in the hard chair near the boarding gate and drew herself in so their bodies weren't touching, trying not to cry. She wanted to disappear. Brad felt the withdrawal and got up to stretch his sore back, which popped. He walked to the men's room to relieve himself. In his absence, Ellie sat up straight and practiced deep breathing like in her old yoga class. The dark clouds of her thoughts lifted and her desire to fix Brad returned. She had a natural way of smoothing things over and she would try just one more time. If that doesn't work, she thought, I cannot be responsible for what I might do anymore. Brad returned and sat next to his wife as pre-boarding was announced. She greeted him with a smile. He could never look at her and find her less pretty than the day they'd met. Honey, nobody at the temple was trying to win anything, she said, deciding to take on the task of correcting him. And they weren't laughing at you. Well, except for the Aruki Gyo. Okay, they set you up once. But it was in fun, and it wasn't their fault you got lost walking around town. They are happy with their lives and need to have some joy. How can you expect to beat monks who practice every day for years? They didn't go to medical school. You wouldn't expect them to come to America and practice medicine, would you? He ignored her attempts to put things in perspective. But they aren't enlightened, even all those years of dedication. The master complained about it. I'll show them. I'm going to get it. Then we can fly back there and Sensei can test me and announce that I got enlightened before any of his monks. You always have to be the best. You should try to relax. Ellie had a natural way of being connected with her experiences and with other people. He was sometimes mystified how she could remain so deeply devoted to him and his constant need to succeed. But now her voice had a sharp edge to it. He must have finally gotten under her skin after these several years together. And it worried him. He didn't know just how worried he should be. Sensi's goal of enlightenment for his monks cavorted in Brad's mind for the entire nine-hour flight. His feet were sore, and his knee cracked when he extended it. His back spasmed if he sat too long in one position. All souvenirs from the regiment at the temple. But the symptoms were forgotten when his busy brain recalled Sensi's lectures, the monk's relentless dedication, and the secret esoteric teachings of Shingon Buddhism Brad had discovered and read on his own. He thought back to his trips to India and Jaya Sweet's passion to get people to awaken to the supreme truth. She had called enlightenment a lot of things. You couldn't pin her down. There was no standard teaching that could be pinned down, not by any of the master teachers, living or dead. It wasn't like school where you studied a subject over and over until you knew it perfectly and aced the test. It was unlike gymnastics or chess, where you could repeat certain moves again and again until you mastered them and win the meet or the tournament. There was something else spiritual seekers from all over the world, as well as full-time temple monks, were failing to do. And because they weren't doing it, they were not awakening to the absolute reality. Brad Rosedale was going to figure out what it was and do it. The flight approached the runway at SFO, and they were barely on the ground when Ellie switched on her cell phone to find bad news. Her mother was in Okayama General Hospital with a hip fracture and had been scheduled for surgery. We should call right away and get an update. Maybe I can help. Brad's heart went out to his wife, who had been steadfast in her efforts to help him. I am so sorry. I, I was cynical about our time at the temple. It did me good. It just took a while to figure out how. Now I have a plan. A new longing to start his spiritual quest had been seeded by his time with the sensei and the monks. Ellie flashed a smile, but couldn't hide her worry. She called as they stood in line for customs and got Otasan on the phone. Her father explained that the prognosis was poor because Okasan also had pneumonia. 
The doctor thought that pneumonia had made her weak and caused the fall that broke her hip. They were treating it with antibiotics and respiratory therapy, but with the broken hip, she couldn't sit up, and it was a potentially fatal combination. They had to operate, but there was a chance she wouldn't survive. Hi, hi, said Ellie, and she ended the phone call. I have to go back to see my parents. I need to take the next flight I can get. Oh, I understand, was all Brad could say, feeling her pain. They finally made it to the baggage carousel, then flagged a taxi. The moment they were home, Ellie took out her laptop and soon had a ticket to Okiyama. I'm leaving tomorrow evening. I scheduled a return for one week, but I may have to extend it, depending on how she is. Okay. We will get through this. I'll do whatever I can from here. Take me to the airport, she said. She opened her suitcase and started replacing her worn clothes with clean ones. Of course, honey. He grabbed her around her waist and hugged her lovingly. After a moment, she set the clothes down and returned his embrace, closing her eyes. He kissed her and said softly, We need to have some pleasure before you go. Following their intimacy, they slept soundly, dreamlessly, and were rejuvenated. In the morning, Ellie's mind was focused on Okasan, while Brad's concern was to discover what was stopping seekers and temple monks on the path to enlightenment. Ellie busied herself with a call to Otisan and housekeeping, while Brad went to the clinic where he was fully booked. He fought through the jet lag that hit him in the afternoon, still burning with the desire to get to his spiritual research. He arrived home at 5 p.m., finding a home-cooked meal of mixed sautéed vegetables, steamed white rice, and baked salmon. There were Japanese cookies from the temple gift shop for dessert. Just like dinner at the temple. No wonder the Japanese have the second longest lifespan in the world. I could never understand why the French have them beat. Some think it's the daily wine and butter. She overlooked his familiar trivia. Okasan seems a little better from her pneumonia. She will be in surgery while I am flying over the ocean. I will pray for her and send positive energy. Will you do that also? Yes, I have a plan to meditate and read my spiritual books. I will visualize healing energy for her in my meditations. He didn't say anything about his goal of beating the monks to enlightenment. He feared the conflict it might provoke and didn't want her leaving on a bad note. Brad took her to the airport, unloaded her luggage, and tried to relieve her concern about Okasan. Let's both try for enlightenment and see who gets it first. You can meditate every day while you're away, and I'll do the same. I like that. Let's do it. She giggled for the first time since the bad news from Japan, but only for a moment. Be sure to keep Okasan in your thoughts and don't forget. I will. Give her my love and tell her I'm sorry she is in pain. Ellie waved goodbye as he drove off. He arrived home, called the clinic to offload a few days and lighten his schedule, and arranged a stack of spiritual texts on his desk. Then he drank a tall glass of water, stretched, and assumed the sitting posture for meditation. It was the same practice he had learned as a teenager over 30 years ago, except for focusing on the third space. His focus was on his breath, as the Swamis taught in India. Pranayama yoga, they called it. Enlightenment could be found through silent mind at the end of the breath. He breathed deeply, rhythmically, until the mental noise receded. Silence arrived, to be broken almost immediately by an arising thought. One thought would present a negative memory of something he had said or done. Another would bring the enticement of a desire or fantasy. The next would circle back around and remind him to focus on the breath. He would start over and repeat it again and again. Sitting for 20 minutes each time, there was no hope for a long meditation that night. During his second session, his mind cleared, and the weight of sleep pressed down heavily on his head and shoulders. Shaking himself, he gasped for a deep breath, the thought of finding stillness interrupted by an image of Okasan on an operating table. He visualized bright white light surrounding her, vitalizing her tissues, promoting healing. But then his will to sustain the image faded, and he slumped from the jet lag. The room buzzed and dimmed, and he forced himself to crawl into bed. It was 4 a.m. when he awoke abruptly. He wasn't sleepy. Sitting in the chair again, he began meditating. I can at least experience the same non-abiding awakening I had after my India trip 15 years ago. He breathed until stillness came. Thoughts arose, obscuring the silence, only for him to circle back to awareness of each breath. Again and again, he'd do this. 30 minutes passed. The inner world grew noisy. The body needed to be adjusted. He got up, stretched, then sat to read selected sections from the teachings of Ramana, Nisargadha, and Buddha. 
A modern work, The End of Your World, had caught his attention with its discussions about traps to enlightenment. Ellie's phone call came. Okasan was out of surgery and surprisingly stable. Her lungs were clearing and she no longer had a fever. He reached for his hard copy of I Am That, one of his favorites, a book that Jayasweta had given him all those years ago in India. She had told him, You have so many questions. Here are the answers. He had read the book cover to cover twice. Now he flipped open to a random page. It was in a section titled, The Self Stands Beyond Mind, a statement by Maharaj Nizar Gadatta, in response to a question on how one finds their sarupa, which in Hindi means real self. Brad's finger followed the words on the page as he read, You are the self, here and now. Leave the mind alone. Stand aware and unconcerned, and you will realize that to stand alert but detached, watching events come and go, is an aspect of your real nature. The questioner then asked, What are the other aspects? To which the Maharaj answered, The aspects are infinite in number. Realize one, and you will realize all. He meditated on it, grasping at various meanings. It brought memories from his studies years ago, the raw material with eloquent descriptions of unity that were expressed as the law of one. Buddha's Lankavatara Sutra, referring to philosophers who were nihilists and mistakenly believed in the idea of non-existence. When he applied deep thought, the ideas of unity and non-existence resonated on some as yet unfathomable level. How could any two concepts be more opposite? Brad gained familiarity with unity. But could anybody get the idea that things could be non-existent? He stood from his meditation and paced around the apartment. He was soon to find out. Returning to his chair, he resumed the cycle of breathing, silent mind, intruding thoughts, reading the works of enlightened spiritual masters. Hours went by, and he remembered to send love and healing energy to Okasan. Then he fell to sleep, which brought odd dreams. The next day was interrupted by work, where he struggled through a double load of patients with various aches and pains. Ellie called two days later with good news. Okasan was sitting up and eating solid food, and the therapist was helping her to stand. But she had lost weight and would need intensive rehabilitation to get her strength back to start walking. I am going to extend my stay here for an additional week, she said. I think our prayers helped, though. The doctor says she is recovering better than expected. That's great. I will keep doing what I can. Thank you, honey. I miss you. I'll call you or text you later. He didn't bother her with his disturbing dreams, or the great aha pulsing through him from contemplating the teachings. He had found a spiritual white elephant right there, plain to see, and nobody wanted to talk about it. The spiritual teachings focused on meditation, acceptance, egolessness, and kindness. The master's stories of how they came to be enlightened tended to be asides or woven thinly throughout the text. Those stories had in common that they had to overcome a dark night of the soul. Brad went through them and ferreted out the awakening stories from a dozen books. One of the best accounts was Osho's essay, My Awakening, in which he referred to hopelessness and helplessness, describing a whole day that was strange, stunning, and shattering. He was becoming a non-being, and by evening, it was hurting. He even compared the pain to when a woman goes into labor. But Osho wasn't alone. They all went through it. Ramana described it well, as did Gautama Buddha who was confronted by an army of demons under the Bodhi tree. I didn't go through a dark night of the soul after my India trip. That was why his awakening then had been temporary, non-abiding. He stood and paced about. He recalled a teacher who described death of the ego and another who proclaimed, kill your ego, free your soul. Fresh on his spiritual journey, he knew there was something deeply wrong about killing any part of oneself, including that rascal ego. The seat was still warm when he sat down for an online search. Starting with ego death, he found complete loss of subjective self-identity. The definition was better than the term, but not by much. He had experienced plenty of moments of such loss of identity, all the way back to his high school meditations in Grandma Mary's basement. There had to be an understanding of the dark night of the soul that went beyond banal concepts about the self. Scanning through the endless list in his Google page, ego dissolution, hallucinogenic drugs, symbols of death, the terms social psychiatry and anxiety appeared together and drew him to read an essay on the implications of international conflict and global problems on the human psyche. Heavy stuff. 
The feeling of uncovering deep new knowledge swelled inside like a bubble of energy. He raced through the material, his knee bouncing, the chair rattling at a fast tempo. Types of your anxiety were listed, and one jumped at him. Cherish convictions that are no longer a source of adequate comfort. The words were gold. He imagined cherished convictions to be things like faith in an afterlife and knowing one's purpose, deep human values and needs. Then it hit him. Cassie's belief that the table and other objects are real was a cherished conviction, challenging her with evidence that the world of solid objects is not the absolute reality, threatened that conviction as a source of comfort. It violated her need to believe that the table is real and not an illusion. Questioning people's beliefs about reality can cause your anxiety by threatening their cherished conviction. He recalled observing teachers ask, what is real? And try to explain that all this stuff around us was just an illusion. People would squirm and grimace. They would startle, their eyes widening like a deer in the headlights. What is real? What exists? Most people cherish their belief that what is seen, heard, and touched represents true reality. Along with listings about the fear of death and annihilation anxiety came the primal fear of non-existence. That read like the mother of all fears. That would be his next step. He would practice silent mind and seek the primal fear of non-existence head on. He sat quietly, focusing on his breath, letting go, allowing for thoughtless awareness, observing the return of thought, doing it again and again. Primed by his days of practice, pure silent awareness would take hold for several breaths. No thought, no sensation, no concept of time or space. Suddenly, a puff of air blew across the back of his neck. Just a nerve discharging. He felt it again. Something is there. He pushed up from his chair, head down, spinning around. Sure, he would catch a creature of some type right behind him. Nothing. His heart raced with a rush of adrenaline. After striding across the room, checking doors and windows, he calmed at last and returned to the chair, stretching his neck and shoulders before resuming the deep breathing. A feeling had gotten under his skin. Something was off. Something was wrong. His mind conjured images of reptilians, evil thought projections, and alien abductors. He pushed his thoughts to clear until stillness became emptiness, then returned to the fearful void that wanted to consume him. Maybe I'm having a psychotic break. He tried to read from the spiritual text, but his mind wandered and the words swam. Finally, he turned on the TV and watched the news until he tired of the distraction and started nodding off. Under the covers in bed, he drifted into sleep. Dreams came and awakened him with the sense that a creature was stirring in the room. He got up to check, then fell back into restless sleep. In the morning, the sheets were twisted up and the bed cover was halfway on the floor. His mind was in a torpor, his body sluggish. Sounds from outside his apartment seemed to come from another world. He pushed his way out of bed and exerted to get his head together. What had made him want this enlightenment? He thought back to his meeting with Jayasweta years ago in India. If you want to awaken to the truth, you have to give all of this up. She had said, sweeping her arm in a wide arc as she gazed into the distance. Give up the whole world and everything in it. He recalled the stunned look on many seekers' faces. Now he could understand. They had briefly encountered courtesy of the guru's masterful teaching, the primal fear of non-existence. After taking care of his bodily needs, he looked in the mirror. His features were dull and hung in a frown. His stomach growled with hunger but he only made it to the couch where he laid down and shifted this way and that until a deeper realization came. Beyond our experience of what we think is reality, beyond even what we know to be illusion, is utter non-existence. What if that was the true ultimate reality? In the afternoon, he forced himself to eat and take a shower. It felt like he was feeding and washing somebody else's body. He tried to rationalize the haunting fear that nothing was real. Then he tried to surrender to it. Let it kill me. Beyond all of this, I don't exist anyway. The days passed until it had been a week since he had dropped Ellie at the airport. His thoughts had become weights inside of him and blackness shrouded his heart. A sense of doom hung around him like a fog. He scanned his mind for inspiration, drawing on the teachings again. The story of Gautama Buddha encountering demons under the Bodhi tree before his enlightenment. Buddha sat meditating for 49 days. That contrasted with the story of Suzanne Segal, 
who had a spontaneous enlightenment while stepping onto a bus in Paris. So many of them, they lived to tell their stories. Their stories grounded him enough to get out the door for walks to eat and shower. He didn't want to talk to anybody. Ellie sent a couple of text messages, which he answered promptly, glad it wasn't a voice call that would have given away his despair. A night came after more than a week when he slept long and dreamlessly. In the morning, he arose with a sense of newness and a shift of awareness. His awareness was without thought. It was the pure awareness of the five senses, things coming and going, the word happening, without a voice or narrator of any kind. He recognized this thoughtless awareness that required no doing. It only needed to be allowed. His body felt lighter and more coordinated. Space and time, inner and outer, flowed as one undivided experience. He had an intent, a wordless will to maintain his inner silence, and went about his routine. Around mid-morning, after lounging about, looking out the window, and attending to some personal care, he allowed thoughts. The first thought was to describe the new state. The reality of the self, objects, and the very experience of time and space have just been transposed. This new sense of reality is an ever-present, unknowable beingness that goes beyond anything I can say to define it. The famous Zen quote came to mind. Before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. He was no longer the doer, which didn't mean that there was nothing to do. In his new perspective, things that needed doing simply got done as a matter of course, if and when they needed to get done. Brad knew from that moment that the wood would get chopped when chopped wood was needed, and the water would get carried when water needed to be delivered. All the actions of humanity, including their suffering, were part of the flow of life, unfolding as part of a great mystery. More could be said, but he was in no hurry. The thing inside that had goaded him since childhood to succeed was gone. In its place was something that he could feel with each breath. Inspiration. Every breath seemed to draw with it a discovery of possibilities in the present moment. Recalling his plan of going back to the temple in Kagoshima to see Sensi and the monks if he experienced enlightenment, he laughed at himself. The big, attached ego self that had desired to do that had been transformed into an unobtrusive, happy camper in the vast space of a new conscious awareness. He was in the flow, and whatever mission wanted to unflow from his life was good. Succeed or die trying had become acceptance and surrender.